Okay, so uh, I'm with writer and game designer Steve Ince, who's famous for working on the Broken Sword series, Beneath the Steel Sky, uh, So Blonde, and many others. So it's a pleasure to have this interview, Steve, and uh, to hear your life story. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. having me. It's always nice to um, be interviewed by people who are interested in these games. Yeah, yeah, a massive Broken Sword fan and um, Beneath the Steel Sky, and I think it's the 10-year um, the anniversary of uh, Broken Sword 5, this year, right? Uh, Is it really? Grief? It yeah. seems to have passed very quickly. Yeah, I think it was released um, 2013, I believe, wow. if my memory serves me well. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, a good time to, you know, to, to to catch up and have, you know, a bit of um, nostalgia as well and, and to hear about, um, you know, um, your, your career. So um, yeah, first, first of all, you know, how's life at the moment for you? Um, quite, quite good. You know, sort of, I've, I've been working, um, you know, freelance um, since my days at uh, Revolution, and um, twenty years I've been working freelance now. So you know, sort of, that's gone pretty well overall. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sort of worked on quite a variety of of projects, as well as obviously my time during during Revolution, where there's a number of projects there that were quite exciting and uh, you know sort of it's it's always um, a pleasure to work on on games that that you know people do enjoy and, and certainly you know with the broken sword games in particular you know sort of um, people enjoy playing them you know over and over again well some do anyway and um, that's always quite gratifying so you know sort of a lot of what i learned during my time at you know uh, at Revolution is um, carried through into into my uh, free, freelance work, and um, you know, sort of, and it has enabled me to to really, you know, sort of embrace embrace the um, freelance life with uh, with gusto, as it were. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, like um, before, we go into more detail about you know the Broken Sword series and so on. What was life? Uh, growing up for you like um you know where did you grow up and um you know maybe tell us a little bit about about that if you don't mind um yeah growing up was was pretty good actually and i grew up in hull which you know sort of well, you know there's <laughs> a lot of um awful things said about hull over the years but um you know as as, as a kid i i i just enjoyed it i just you know <laughs> um you know, I grew up in the 60s and there was still a lot of evidence of, you know, kind of like the the bombing that, that took place during the war. I mean, it was one of the, you know, sort of most bombed cities outside of London, you know, sort of Hull and Liverpool, I think, you know, sort of were among the worst. Um, and, you know, so there were still, you know, like big gaps in the, you know, in the streets where, where you know sort of buildings had been bombed and things like this and in fact just across the street from where we lived there was an empty ground where a school had been firebombed during the war and so wow. because and, and nothing had been done with it because you know sort of there was a lot more pressing matters so like 20 years after the war um this this waste ground was still there and we used to play on it even though it was covered in you know, all sorts of broken glass and rubble and stuff. Like <laughs> you know, um, and um, so you know, it's quite regular to go in. You know, at the end of the day, with you know, grazed and cut knees and things like this. But you know, it's just just part and parcel of growing up. Yeah. But, Did you um, um sort of like uh, play lots of um I don't know games back in those days, logical games, puzzles. I'm just trying to think if like your childhood, you know, had an, an impact, in, you know, on, on your career in, in later life, you know, we were always involved in, you know, logical things and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, um, or maybe practical as a, as a, as a kid. Um, I'm not sure, you know, we really thought of games like, I mean, I used to play a lot of board games and things like this um some card games but you know there was a lot of i used to read a lot i used to you know watch such as thunderbirds and stingray and and, and so on um big fan of, of jerry anderson's 
work, which, you know, sort of fired my imagination in many ways. Um, you know, sort of, I was, I was always good at maths and science, um, you know, at school and, and things like this. So, you know, sort of, I developed a kind of, I, I don't know, I suppose it was just a logical brain. I mean, I went on to study uh, science and, and maths at A level and then and then went to university to study astronomy and astrophysics. So <laughs> I suppose I've always been logical in many respects, but I never really thought about it as um, in a in a game game design sense at all. Mm. Um, certainly, we used to make up games like when we were kids, you know. We'd, but there were more kind of like you know sort of. I don't know the sort of thing games kids made up in in the street. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying, I can't think of anything specific now. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> um, I guess that you always had like a vivid imagination. I suppose then. Yeah. Um, you said you were a you you know you've always been an avid uh, reader. So uh, do you think that kind of helped you to to be creative later on in life with oh, with your games? Definitely, mm. um, you know, I, well, you know, before I, you know, sort of even came close to to um, working in, in video games, I used to try my hand at writing um, back in my teens and, and my early 20s and stuff. Um, and I quickly came to the conclusion that I was rubbish, <laughs> 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 which I was at the time, you know, sort of my writing skills and abilities came on much later. You know, sort of the. I guess that that you know there are far more books around about you know how to be a, a good writer and, and stuff. Than there were, back then. In fact, I only ever found one book on writing, and that was by, oh my God, aspects of the novel by. Oh God, uh, it'll come to me, but. <laughs> You know, so so it, it was always it was always, I always found it difficult to kind of you know sort of like get into the you know the way that that stories and books worked. Even though I was such an avid reader, you know, it's 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 just understanding you know kind of like the differences between you know plot and story and character and all this kind of stuff that, mm. that I had to learn you know later. But anyway you know sort of so so you know sort of like i do remember getting a uh commodore 64 when they came out and i was fascinated by some of the games on that um and but you know never well i, I did have a brief um dabble with with trying to code some game type stuff um but i couldn't get into the machine code side of it so i just gave up um mm. you know and you really needed machine code to to make the games play fast enough so, so would this be in, in like the the 80s then that sort of period yeah, of time yeah, yeah sort of mm. um early 80s when, when when it first came out i think it was um so yeah i mean you know sort of i had interest in it you know back then um but i didn't actually join the games industry until 93 beginning of 93 right oh, okay so prior to that then you um so you went you went to university you studied uh, was it astronomy and um astrophysics that's right yes yeah so how, how was that experience then for you did you know <laughs> um not as good as i thought it would be um not because there's any, there was anything wrong with the course or, or subjects or anything like this, but because I kind of reached my plateau, you know, because a lot of it was math mathematics, um, because you know, sort of, I mean, when you when you're talking about astronomy and astrophysics, there's just so many mathematical formulae and calculations and so on, um, and you have to kind of introduce something what's what's called spherical trigonometry. You know, sort of like you, it's like you know, superimposing you know, sort of image, you know, sort of like triangles and angles and stuff like this on a sphere, which is what how you have to look at the sky, 
you know, sort of as if you're looking at the, you know, the inside of a sphere. And of course, spherical trigonometry is very different to ordinary. And getting your head around that is, is quite, quite problematical. Mm. And, and then there was, you know, sort of like quantum mechanics and, and so on. And it just, I think I just reached a plateau um, before getting to, to that high enough level to really qualify with a good degree. So unfortunately, you know, it was, you know, sort of any thoughts of, of doing research or anything like that just kind of went by the by. Um, so <laughs> I got so when you graduated then, did you, did you have any idea about the video game industry at, at that point in time? Did you see yourself in it? No, it hmm. no. I mean, we played, we played games, you know, I mean, the space invaders, I think was out by then and, and Pac-Man. Um, and there was also some arcade games like um, space wars and things like this. Uh, what else was that? There was something. Oh, yes, the university computer, you know, or, or some students had, had, you know, programmed this game on the on the university computer um, based on Star Trek, you know, sort of, you know, there's a Klingon, you know, sort of, there's a Klingon vessel coming up on your right. What do you do? <laughs> and the, pro <laughs> the problem was, it was just kind of like, you typed in an instruction and then it printed out what happened. <laughs> there was no visuals at all, no screen, you know, sort of computers didn't have screens in those days, not, not properly. Um, and so you, you, you typed, you know, like, you know, fire photon torpedoes and, the, and then you get a printout, which a moment later, which would say put photon torpedoes missed. And, Mm -hmm. I don't know, it just didn't quite work as, as that sort of came for me. So I wasn't enamoured of that. I mean, you know, sort of, and, and really, until the visuals got, got better with, you know, well, Commodore 64, for instance, you know, sort of, suddenly you were seeing things, you know, so much more differently. Yeah. Know? And that, that appealed to me much more. So um, when you graduated from university, would that be, what sort of date would that be? The uh, mid-80s? 79. No, 79. Uh, 79. 79. So um, you said you got into the game industry in 93. So between sort of gra graduating and then um, working for Revolution, um, what, what sort of jobs did you have in bet uh, you know, between, <laughs> between those dates? Yeah, what uh, sort dates? of jobs? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The... Well, when, yeah, after I left university, I, I sort of floundered for a bit and then got a job with um, Mecca as a, a trainee manager in a bingo hall, um, then got to be assistant manager. Um, and that meant, you know, learning all the, all the ropes. So I was bingo calling one day and selling tickets another day and <laughs> all this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, saving behind the bar and all sorts, you know, sort of, mm -hmm. and that was very mixed. Um, and at first it was quite exciting and fun and, and stuff, but, you know, sort of, then I actually started watching the people, you know, the customers, and it struck me that this was a kind of business that was exploiting a kind of weakness that, that these people had, which was, you know, a, a weakness for gambling. I mean, not everybody, you know, sort of the word, the people who genuinely went for a bit of fun or, you know, because it was a, a night out with a friends or something like this. And, and that, that was fine. Um, but there were people who, you know, would go every night and they would, you know, spend money that they probably couldn't afford and, and, and things like this and the hope of getting a big win. And I just, it just felt a bit exploitative. So I left mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sort of, uh, so it took me two years to figure that out, <laughs> but it was, it was interesting. And, um, you know, sort of it's, it's, I think gambling is an unfortunate thing. I mean, we see constant adverts for gambling now um, yeah. on the television. And I think it's just appalling. I mean, when I worked for Mecca, um advertising gambling was illegal 
So at some point the law changed and I'm not sure exactly when that happened. Uh, and I think it's overdone now. So I think that somehow we need to stop the advertising of gambling. Um, yeah. But, but <laughs> you know, sort of, I know that's not really <laughs> the sort of um, gaming question you might, you know, be interesting. But, oh, but just... it's, it's good to hear. Yeah, you know, it's good to hear the background. It's good. To, cause I, I guess in, no, in that type of job as well, I, I suppose, you know, you developed, you know, your, 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 your social skills as well. You got to meet different types of characters and maybe... I don't know that could have like you know um made you it made you more open minded and sort of with the humor as well because like the games that you are involved with is, is, there's always like a you know a, quite a good sense of humor mm. involved so I don't know if maybe you know it kind of had an impact on well, I think the way that, that you wrote yeah. and stuff like that I don't know I think everything we do has an impact on us and how we yeah. how we you know approach our creativity and, and, and the like and i think that, that you know sort of we can only make our characters interesting and exciting and and varied you know by knowing how people behave in real life you know, yeah sort of um and and you know I, one of the things that i often suggest that people do is is you know travel by bus or train or something like this and and listen to other people talking which sounds awfully like eavesdropping <laughs> but I, I don't mean you know to intentionally eavesdrop i mean you know to listen to the patterns of the way they talk and the way that you know sort of two people when they're talking will interrupt each other and or finish each other's sentences so or or, or you know if they know each other very well they'll often talk in in kind of a you know, like a shorthand, you know, they don't have to finish every, every sentence because the other mm. person will know what they mean or, or, you know, they'll make references to their shared histories and things like this, you know, and, and people, you know, sort of do talk differently, but they also talk similarly as well, you know, um, particularly when they're good friends, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, copy each other's speech pattern thing so you listen to these these different people you know it's, you don't have to be on a bus or a train it can be in a cafe it can be you know sort of a, down the pub and, and so on and you know it's just about observing and you know sort of seeing so you know things like that and you know being in the bingo industry is, is valuable in that sense but also, you know, so after that, I, I worked in a, a metal refinery for a while, which right. was very strange, but I, it was only meant to be a temporary job, <laughs> you know, like a summer job, while I sort of like found something better. But, but they offered us all a permanent, <clears throat> a permanent position, and it was actually a very good wage at the time. So um, it was um, difficult to turn down turned down so i ended up being there eight years uh, and there were some right characters there i'll tell you <laughs> yeah i can imagine <laughs> uh, so um you know um so it was interesting you know and, and and i'm glad i did those things for the fact that you know they do they do provide um inspiration at times you know one of the things i love is is creating characters and a lot of them tend to be cats but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so um <coughs> excuse me sorry um that's okay so um when you finished in 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 the factory then was um did you go straight to to revolution from there in in, in 1993 um there was a short period where i actually went on one of these these government retraining schemes that were trying to get people into you know kind of areas and i said look i, I want to do something creative um and, and and it was fortunate that that um you know there were people involved who you know could give me advice on that score and stuff like this and then one guy he actually called me up and said <clears throat> i've got someone who's looking for somebody who's artistic um they run a video game 
company. <laughs> oh, brilliant, you know, sort of. And this was when Revolution were based in Hull. So I went along to uh, a meeting with some uh, some portfolio because they were looking for an artist. Um, and I've always I've always dabbled with with drawing and painting and stuff like this. So I took along a load of stuff, uh, and then they gave me a test, which was one of the images from Beneath the Steel Sky. They they gave me the Dave Gibbons sketch and asked me to do painting based on it. So I did that, but then um, based on that, uh, I went down to meet Dave Gibbons himself with Charles and we had a nice chat and the upshot of that was I got the job. So um, um, I started as a, as a, as an artist doing um, background work um, doing a lot of conversion work from full colour <clears throat> um, scans of the paintings into down to 128 um, colours for the PC and then down to 32 colours for the Amiga, which was a very tricky thing to do. You had to do it in a very specific way. Yeah. But I also did some, um, some animation from Beneath Steel Sky as well. Um, like the steam in the <laughs> in the bower room and the rocks falling in the diagonal tunnel and ah uh, yeah um, I remember that yeah um, and lots of other little, little bits and pieces um, so yeah so that's how I started so um, then like before um, so when you worked on Beneath the Steel Sky had you you know were you sort of playing video games at, at that point anyway you know um, did um, were you aware of the type of you know of those types of uh, point and click adventure games. No, I must admit that at that point I I hadn't pay, played a point and click adventure, <laughs> which is very strange. Um, but I I really got into them very quickly, um, and I loved them. You know, sort of. You know, it was it was fantastic because, you know, sort of in many respects, you know, back in Steel Sky days, you know, because the the uh, monitors were such a low resolution, like 320 by 240. Um, a lot of um, adventure games are actually at the cutting edge of, of video game art because, you know, they were, they yeah. were, you know, sort of creating the most artistic backgrounds. Um, lots of other, lots of games like, you know, action games and that weren't really kind of <clears throat> delivering that high level of art, you know, and it's, it's, it's odd to look at that um, now with, you know, what we, what we know of like 3D games and, and, and so on. And to think that adventure games were, you know, the, at the cutting edge of game development. Yeah. So um, for you then with Beneath the Steel Sky, what would you say you know, what would be the sort of the highlight of that uh, for you then? What, you know, what did you like most about, about being involved in Beneath the Steel Sky? I just love the, the, I mean, I was only involved in a small part of it, obviously, you know, doing my little bit on the, you know, some of the backgrounds and, and as I say, I'm, you know, some of the animations and, and such. Um, but what happened was that, you know, sort of, the, it was a relatively small team. I think there were eight of us for the most of it. And when I joined, there were six people in the company. I joined at more or less the same time as another programmer, so that made eight. And then shortly afterwards, there was there was nine when when another artist joined. Um, but you know, sort of having that sort of talk, you know, sort of small knit in a group of people meant you, you could all learn off each other so much, you know, and, and there was a couple of really good animators. Uh, one in particular a guy called Steve Odes, and he was just brilliant, you know, sort of like what he could do with pixels was, <laughs> was beyond compare really. Cut him at the time. <laughs> yeah. And he, he just yeah. did fantastic work on these animations, you know, it's like little, you know, sort of they look like little things now, 
but they were quite major you know sort of there's there's um one part one part where where foster gets this this um device and you know implanted into his head and this this kind of like big helmet comes down over him <laughs> yeah. you know, and and sort of zaps him and his arms and legs are going like crazy and and and, <laughs> and such and it's just it's just a brilliant little animation um you know it's a one-off um but you know there's just such care and attention yeah and then and then in that same location you've got um dr burke who pulls on this big rubber glove and sticks his hand inside the guy the guy on the bed <laughs> oh that's that's hilarious that is yeah <laughs> you know and the guy is about, just sort of yeah, yeah. You know, he's got this big open stomach and he just plunges his hand <laughs> into all the blood and guts and the guy's just lying there as if nothing's happening and it's just <laughs> it is so funny but you know and some of those things some of those animations weren't actually decided until you know sort of like um we saw the location screens themselves you know they'll get painted up and converted <clears throat> and then um you know sort of steve would probably say oh what if we had an animation of him reaching inside you know <laughs> and so that was it you know it wasn't planned in a, a lot of that stuff wasn't planned in advance um i mean some of it was you know like the the getting the the uh port put into his head I mean, obviously that's part of the design, but you know, some of the peripheral stuff is is just kind of like, oh, wouldn't it be good if we did this? Yeah, I think that's the sign of being creative, though, isn't it? You just kind yeah. of you do it, you know, off the cuff or whatever, and just yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that that was part of the process of of designing games in those days. You know, sort of the you know the the animators had some free reign to to put in stuff like that um whereas i don't know these days you you tend to you tend to try and plan everything out so far in advance anywhere that you don't have time to to do that that kind of off the cuff fun stuff as it were um but i mean still games are still great obviously but i sometimes think that there's with with Steel Sky, there was a kind of edge that just came from people having fun, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know, <laughs> but that's the first game I I worked on, and there's a lot of nostalgia attached to that. <laughs> but it was just it was just great fun to work on, um, and to see it come to life, to see it being played, and and so on. Yeah, you know. Great, great storyline, and for me, um, I mean, I was four years old when that first came out, so I, I didn't play <laughs> it um, at the time. But uh, you know, many years later, I did, and yeah, for me, I just love the, um, you know, there's a lot of like northern accents. Uh, I think Lamb was was he from uh, uh, Yorkshire yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah. You know, the is it the manager? Was he the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the manager of the place? Yeah, he he was absolutely hilarious. Um, yes, you know, yeah, just the, vo- the voiceovers, the just the intelligence that was put into that was was phenomenal. I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you didn't get involved yeah, in any of the vo- the voiceover aspect then? Well, that. actually, you know, kind of, we we released the game, um, just as text only. Um, so it was only later that we actually, um, created the uh, recorded the voices for it and and created. Ah, okay, didn't know that. Right. <clears throat> Well, originally it was created the voices for what was it the CD thirty two version for the Amiga, um, and then obviously did a did a PC version because you know sort of um, you know CDs were only just coming into their own as a kind of medium for computers, so not many people had them. You know, sort of floppy disks are still really the the mainstay. Um, so, in a sense, um, Steel Sky was one of the first uh, games to to get voices. I mean, there were, there were a number of others, but you know, sort of it was it was in that first tranche of of games with voices. Um, but I actually got involved not with the recording itself, 
<laughs> I had to cut up all the voice samples. <laughs> oh. these, these days, recording is is um, has been refined, you know, by by studios, and they have systems with it that allow them to to cut up these samples, um, you know, sort of like one at a time. So what happened was that we got sent all these DAT tapes, which was what the voices were recorded on. And, and these are high quality tapes, um, although they're quite small, they're, they're, they're high quality. And so what we had to do was we had to essentially get that off the DAT tapes onto the computer hard drives. And, and then, you know, sort of like you had these long files you know sort of and, and had to cut them up into individual lines and make sure that you know sort of they were as short as possible so you, you had to trim them to just before the 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 voice started and just after it, it, it ended you know so it was quite <clears throat> quite tedious work <laughs> yeah it's all to say um, it i guess great. these days you take for granted you just you know you wouldn't even yeah. need to go to that depth but yeah so you know sort of it was it was great to hear all the voices, but honestly, the cutting them up into these individual lines was so tedious, you know, and mm. they all had to have the right code name, you know, because they get referenced by a you know, numerical code rather than a, a, a name. So oh, it was <laughs> it was quite a chore, but yeah, you know, it was just sounds, good to hear like that. It. It was, you know, it was really good to hear the, the the voices in the game. As you say, there was just such a variety of accents and, and so on. Yeah, and I sort of like there was a brummy guy, the guard or something like this, and then, you know, um, yeah, it was just it was just brilliant. So, based on 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 just like the final question with beneath the Steve Sky, what would you say was like the best moment in in the game for you? What would you say? For you was like maybe the funniest moment or just <laughs> one that sort of you you always remember the most um well, it's got to be the dog hasn't it the dog getting dumped in the uh in in the lake <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah L- uh, lady piemont wasn't it? lady piemont's dog is that right yeah yeah that's right yeah um and she was just um you know the dog was just brilliant you know sort of because it was so annoying and Ended up being so satisfying dump, dumping him in, into the into the water, um, <laughs> and it was quite a good, um, quite a good puzzle as well because there were a number, quite a number of elements that had to come together in order to get, you know, to get it to play properly, um, you know, getting the biscuits, and, you know, putting them in the right, right place and getting the ah uh, yeah on like the, that place. Oh, yeah, the so, plank isn't it. You put yeah. it on the plank, and then yeah. So, so it was, you know, it was, it was, you know, sort of like a pleasure to kind of like see all that come together and get that that brilliant reward of him flying up into the air off screen and then coming down. <laughs> um, yeah, that was just brilliant. Um, but there's also a really other really good um, puzzle as well, and it's one of my favourite puzzles. Even I mean, I I wasn't involved in the design of it in any way, shape, or form. And that's, you know, sort of like getting the cable and the anchor um, to act as a grappling hook so you can swing into the security building. Ah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the security building is one of the first you see right at the beginning of the game, but it takes a while before you actually get to the point of of getting the anchor. And there's so much involved in, you know, sort of like distracting the guy and you know, sort of like getting a cable and fitting fitting Joey with the welder's um, shell in order that he can cut the cable. You know, before these things all come together, um, that allow the it, you know allow you to get inside that building. So it was quite satisfying as well. You know, when you when you do that, when you pull all these things together. So. Yeah. So when it was released, then you know, was the general. Um... You know, was the team happy with the, you know, uh, the success or, you know, the, the units that were sold with, with, with that? Um, I with believe that so. I mean, yeah. you know, so <laughs> I, I, it was one of those things where, I, you know, sort of um, Virgin seemed to be very happy, you know, the, who are the publishers. 
Um, so you know they they wanted us to another do another game. Obviously, they, so we moved on to Broughton Sword very quickly after that. Pressing the button again. Now you've done it, mate. I'll have to take the old lobby. And you better stay here in case there's an explosion. Uh-oh, the tunnel roof doesn't look too stable. Who's up there? You won't escape that way! The jumped, fell all the way to ground level. Phew, lucky escape. Security symbol. That must be their headquarters. Hey, Lamb. Thanks for the tour. You're welcome. I hope you've learned something about pipes. Oh yes, it was most instructive. From now on, whenever I smell raw sewage, I'll think of you, Gilbert. Lamb. Is your coat made of real fur? That's right, real beaver fur made from the last ten beavers in the world. Do you like it? It's totally cool. And expensive. What's your opinion of lamb? I'm a D-Link. I'm not entitled to an opinion. But to be honest, I think he's a turd. Do you have a problem? Aye, lad. I was hoping to see you. My card isn't working, and I can't use the elevator. Perhaps you've been made a D-Link. Don't be so bloody impertinent, lad. What will poor little Cuss Cuss do? Who's Cuss Cuss? My pussy. She has to be fed. What would I do if she died? Make a hat to match your coat? I don't think that's very funny, lad. Besides, cat and beaver fur wouldn't match. I could feed her for you. If I could get into your apartment. You go down to Bellevue, and I'll authorize it so you can. By the way, Cuss Cuss likes to be pampered. Like all women, eh, lad? <laughs> Apart from D. Lynx, you mean. You need therapy, lamb. What goes on in here? It's me workshop. <laughs> like it? I don't think much of the paintwork. Yeah, I know what you mean. I thought about redecorating, but I couldn't be asked. Excuse me. 
want this sandwich? You nick me neckwurst. I had to inspect it. Oh, that was me lunch. No harm done. No? Look at your fingernails. They're a breeding ground for microorganisms. Those breasts are never natural. Bet those muscles are artificially developed. I wouldn't bear my bum if it looked like that. A nose like that would be great for tracking. It's an old phrenological diagram. Poor devil. Hello there. You're conscious. Oh, yes. You don't look so good. Well, thanks very much. Full marks for your bedside manner. Have you brought me any grapes? What a dump. I wouldn't want to go there. A big female robot with a welding torch. Can I interest you in this? A rogue robot policy. I've never heard of that before. It's a safeguard against the possibility of your robot turning on you. Joey would never do that. Aha! So you think. Surveys show that 42% of all domestic droid owners are worried about the risk of attack. This is bullshit, Foster. Don't listen to that moron. Nasty temper that robot's got, yeah? Tell me more about the policy. All you have to do is sign a form. We'll do a probability estimate and give you the results next month. How come it takes so long? We have to strip the robot down and analyze each component. I do not want him handling my parts, Foster. Excuse me. Hold it. Your uh, membership card, please? I don't have one. This is a private club. Oh, I didn't know that. You do now. Peace off. Do you know anyone who'd sponsor me? Mm, what about old widow Piermont? She used to come here, oh, years ago. If you chatted her up, she might sponsor you. I don't know Mrs. Piermont personally. Oh, you must have seen her with her dog. Mrs. Piermont is the one with two legs. Is my father still alive? I've not seen him since my husband's funeral. What a magnificent occasion. I wish I could have stayed until the end. You walked out of your husband's funeral? I had no choice. Poor Spunky hates cathedrals. All that incense and droning makes him bilious. No sooner had I got him outside than up came his breakfast. It's a good thing he didn't chuck in church. Don't interrupt, darling. Well, when I got back, they were all gone. Congregation, choir, coffin and all. Why didn't you want to visit the club? The memory is a true painful. Did you go there with the professor? Yes. We met in a club. Oh, he was a handsome young graduate. And I was a flower in my first bloom. He plucked me from the Garden of Innocence. I see what you mean. The memories are painful. It's full of biscuits and dog drool.
little crunchy doggy snacks. is worse than his bark. What was that splashing noise? Where has Spunky gone? What are the band called? The Hawk Club Quartet. But there's only three of them. Yeah, the saxophonist OD'd last month. Did the saxophonist OD on drugs? No. Too much sax. He got overexcited and ruptured his lungs. There's something in there. Something horrible. This could be the most stupid thing I've ever done. Are you all right, sir? Do I look all right? Mr. Foster? Foster is no more. I am Link. I am the future.